monitoring with our speaker, Jan Dixon, for the last 12 years out at Kitty Todd Nature Preserve. Um, so I'm honored to introduce her tonight. Um, after retiring, she kind of started a second career um, of volunteering her time for the betterment of nature. Um, she's been doing lots of monitoring. She serves on several boards. Um, she has written several articles. She's done stewardship work. Um, she does all kinds of um, education um, for the public. Um, she's a wonderful resource. She's written articles for NAVA, the North American Butterfly Association. Um, she writes articles for Wild Ones and Toledo Naturalists and other organizations as well. Um, she's raised butterflies um, for nine to ten years, um, as well as she's put in much work um, into gardening in her own yard for butterflies and birds um, and part of where her passion began. Um, and so tonight, luckily, um, we are lucky enough to have her for, to share the information of some of the butterfly research um, that we've done out at Kitty Todd. Um, and Jan has been doing it out there for 14 years. So thank you, Jan, for joining us. Um, and please, you can take it away. Um, I'm going to just make one more note before we start. Um, if you could mute yourself, if you are not Jan, then that would help us with uh, being able to hear Jan better. And keep yourself muted. Thank you. And I'm going to stop my sharing. So Jan, you can. Oh, there you go. Okay. Can you can you hear me? We can. It feels so odd not to. I'm sorry. You can't see a picture of me, but we had some technical difficulties, and so. I apologize for that, but um, thank you, Angie, for that most kind introduction, and good evening, everyone, and thank you all so much for zooming in. It's a beautiful evening. Uh, the butterflies need our help, as you will see, and I appreciate your presence and interest very much. Butterflies at the Nature Conservancy's Kitty Todd have been monitored since 2007. There have been two areas monitored and the research results I'm sharing today relate to one of the transects that follows a walking path that starts in the demonstration garden at the office area off of Old State Line Road. This transect was first monitored by Jackie Riley, then Jackie and I in 2007 and 2008. Angie Cole and I have monitored this same transect from 2009 to 2020. Consistent monitoring has resulted in 14 years of documented butterfly history in relation to numbers and species that have been observed. Angie Cole has been a great partner. Anyone who has ever been in the field with Angie knows she has four sets of eyes, front, back, and each side. She is alert to anything that moves or looks different and she's responsible for seeing the majority of the butterflies on our count. If you have not had a chance to visit Kitty Todd, I think you would enjoy the experience. It is open every weekday from nine to five and Saturday and Sunday of the first full weekend of the month. It is a beautiful place with native demonstration gardens, prairies, and oak savannas. These photos were taken on our transect. Kitty Todd is normally a very quiet, peaceful place, no bikes or dogs, but once in a while you will hear a shot from the Toledo Muzzle Lotus Club that is not far away. However, not to worry, Angie and I have not been hit yet or you might be lucky enough to hear and see part of the National Guard, the 180th fighter wings fly overhead in formation. But neither of these two events seem to affect the butterflies or birds or should detract from an otherwise quiet walk. The monitoring we have been doing is through the Ohio Lepidopterist with the joint partnership of the Ohio Division of Wildlife and the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. All of our data at the end of the butterfly season is sent to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History where records are maintained. The Ohio Lepidopterist is an organization formed 
1979 that has two programs every year, as well as field trips and an informative newsletter. Membership cost is minimal at $15 yearly, and you can join online. Every year in the spring, the Ohio Lepidopterist has a workshop at the end of March or the first week in April. The workshop is geared towards training new monitors as well as continuing important education for all monitors. It's a good time for monitors to pick up educational materials, share with each other, review trends, and discuss special sightings and concerns. However, everybody is welcome. You don't have to be a monitor to attend the workshops. And there are several interesting breakout sessions, including topics like butterfly identification and butterfly gardening. This year, due to the pandemic, there will be no workshop, unfortunately. Monitoring begins the first week in April and ends usually in October when butterflies are no longer being seen. It involves a weekly walk on the same path, counting and identifying to the best of abilities butterflies that are seen in a defined area. This area is an imaginary box, 15 feet wide, 15 feet tall, and extending 15 feet ahead. In most cases, a transect involves several different habitats that are distinguished by numbers. For example, a wooded area, a sunny, dry area, or a wet, sunny area. The numbers are listed on a weekly monitoring form and butterflies recorded in the proper section of the transect when seen. And this is called the Pollard transect. Angie and I have found it fun and helpful to carry a camera. A photo is great when a butterfly flies quickly out of sight, not leaving enough time for a close look. A review later is sometimes crucial to identification. And here is the monitoring form that is used. Time, temperature, I'm trying to show here. Time, temperature, cloud cover, wind speed and direction are recorded at the start and end of the monitoring. There are parameters according to when to monitor, usually between 11 and three when butterflies are most seen, but also there are requirements about the temperature and the amount of cloud cover. This is usually important in the beginning of the season when the temperatures are lower and when the amount of sun present can make a difference as to whether or not you're going to see them. I encourage you all to think about monitoring. Perhaps there is a park or even your garden where you see butterflies and it's not currently being monitored. Ohio is unique and special in all the United States as it is the only state that has maintained a history of butterfly research for 22 years. A few locations in Europe have such a distinguished record as well. Monitoring began when Dr. Jerome Weedman in the Columbus area noticed an absence of this beautiful regal fritillary. This lovely butterfly once seen throughout Ohio disappeared about 30 years ago. His curiosity about butterfly research led him to Europe and the Pollard transect research method that was developed by a lepidopterist in England and used today in Ohio. Dr. Weedman and others analyzed 21 years of monitoring data and published a paper about their findings in 2019. The alarming results are seen here. Total abundance decline for 81 species is 2% per year with the cumulative result of 33% reduction in butterflies over 21 years. Three times as many species have negative population trends compared to positive trends. And these results, unfortunately, mirror long-term European monitoring as well. Looking at the research based on the transect that Angie Cole and I have been monitoring indicates a decline of about 30% of about in abundance since 2007. 
resulting in an average of 2.1% decline every year. And these figures are based on data through 2020, which unfortunately was not a good year for the butterflies. Of course, butterfly populations are highly cyclical, which you will see in a yearly summary of numbers of some specific butterflies later. However, the total yearly numbers tell a sad story of overall decline, something experienced intuitively over the years. So what are the causes of this decline? Well, first of course, is a loss of habitat that comes with continued development and an overall reduction in native plants that our butterflies need to survive. Another problem is fractured habitats that are widely separated, making it difficult for butterflies to disperse between areas and create new populations. This reduces the overall gene pool. Farming practices, including the use of all land, no room along the roads for native plants like milkweed, and the crops that are being grown are not beneficial to our butterflies. And of course, the overuse of pesticides, particularly the neonicotinoids, which have been killing bees and other insects like butterflies. And finally, global warming, creating earlier warming with life cycle needs of butterflies out of sync with plants. And severe weather events like hard and continuous rains and up and down temperatures in spring and droughts in the summer. Rains in the spring have often been hard and long. I have personally experienced a loss of American lady caterpillars after a hard rain. The rains can wash away eggs and drown small caterpillars. A lack of rain in the summer months can affect the condition of plants and of course, the health of caterpillars that are dependent on those plants. The European skipper photo in the upper left-hand corner is unfortunately one that has shown decline across Ohio and in our transect as well. This chart shows total individuals counted each year on the transect from 2007 through 2020. As you can see, there are certainly ups and downs, but when you look at it overall, there is a decline. Also, we were disappointed last year to see only 43 species. Some important butterflies were not seen. So last year, we only had 1,112 butterflies that we counted, with the average being 1,665. 2012 uh, was a drought year, and you can see the big difference, the big drop in number the following year, going from 2,271 to 1,275 that year. This chart also illustrates the up and down numbers over the years, but unfortunately, an overall decline in numbers. This graph shows a 30% reduction overall in the number of butterflies counted over the 14 year period. And this is about the same percentage as shown in the 2019 research of 21 years of Ohio statewide butterfly monitoring. So let's look at the monarchs. The monarchs had a great showing in 2019. We had one day in September when we counted 62 on September 6. They were present over Kitty Todd and over everywhere in Toledo area migrating that year. Unfortunately, 2020 was not a good year for the monarchs. We counted only 37 last year. And I experienced the same reduction in numbers in my gardens at home. Also, the 21-year Ohio study I just shared indicated an overall 7% decline in monarchs. I attribute the super numbers in 2019 to the work and care of many people like you in Northwest Ohio who planted milkweed, including the zoo that made a special effort to raise monarchs. 
I think this illustrates the importance of host plants and what can be done to save our butterflies. Host plants, of course, are the very specific plants each species needs to complete the caterpillar stage of their development. Caterpillars have evolved to be able to digest the chemicals in certain plants only. This is something that may be well known to you, but not to others. I was surprised a few years ago when I was in the company of some very experienced naturalists and discovered the need for specific host plants was something not understood. Unfortunately, the swallowtails had a really poor year last year. Um, there was a big decline in the tiger black as well as the spice for swallowtails that Kitty Todd. You can see here we had 13 only tiger, the lowest we've ever had, six black and the lowest number ever for spice bush as well. We felt fortunate to see two giant swallowtails. And I, I experienced the same thing at home. Usually I have, I have all the host plants for those swallowtails and I just was not seeing eggs or the caterpillars even though I saw a few of the butterflies. I think the good news here though, is the impact homeowners and gardeners everywhere can have on the swallowtails. The host plants for each of these species are readily available and can be found locally or ordered through a catalog. Plant it and they will come, we hope. There is a great list of sources for native plants available on the Wild Ones website, and many can be purchased at the annual Wild Ones plant sale. So let's look at the host plants. Tiger swallowtails will use both black cherry and tulip poplar trees as a host. The black swallowtail hosts include golden alexanders, as well as many herbs in the carrot family, such as dill, parsley, and fennel. And spicebush swallowtails benefit from two beautiful shrubs spice bush and sassafras. We have a lot of sassafras at Kitty Todd and that's why the um, spice bush swallowtail has done so well there. Um, and the spice bush shrub is a beautiful shrub. I have several in my yard. They've got uh, very pretty yellow blooms early in the spring. And the giant swallowtail will use wafer ash tree and also um, non-native um, herb rue. Of course, if you plant for the swallowtails, you may have these interesting caterpillars show up in your yard. They are fun for photographers because they can't fly yet. Caterpillars grow in what are known as instars and have several different looks depending on the instar. The four shown here are in one of the last stages before pupation. Caterpillars certainly vary and have developed specific strategies to avoid predation. In the case of the spice book and tiger, the fake eyes are meant to alarm predators. And also you can see the green color certainly matches the leaves that they're on. The black and giant caterpillars mimic bird droppings. And you can especially see that in the giant swallowtail caterpillar. That photo was taken at Hal Mann's house. He has a wafer ash tree. So here are the instars for the spice bush swallowtail, and you can see how they change. In this slide, um, this is this caterpillar is only two days old, and you can see the progression finally ending up in kind of an orange yellow uh, before they actually form a chrysalis. And in this photo, you can see this leaf that looks all dried up. One of the strategies to avoid predation for the spice bush is that they curl up in a leaf. They, they make a, a something that will close the leaf and that, that's where they spend their day. And then they come out and eat only at night and return to the same leaf to spend the, the following day.
There have been six species of whites and sulfurs counted on our transect. Three of these species, little yellow, cloudless, and dainty sulfurs are migrants or butterflies that fly up from the south and are usually seen towards the end of the season, August to October. These species are not strong enough to survive our winters, but do lay eggs and attempt another brood here. It is not predictable from one season to the next which and how many of the migrants will appear. However, the cloudless sulfur is showing increasing numbers locally, and the host are species in the Senna family, partridge pea and Senna. Our resident whites and sulfurs, cabbage white, clouded, and orange, unfortunately continue to experience declines. Usually one of the first butterflies seen in Northwest Ohio is the cabbage, and they are often seen throughout the season in large numbers. And these same three butterflies also showed a big decline in the 21 year study published in 2019. So you can see how the small numbers that we saw last year. And I wanted to um, talk about the dainty sulfur. The only year we've ever seen the dainty sulfur was in 2012, and that was a drought year. And I, we hypothesized that probably they were coming north uh, to seek moisture. We haven't seen them since, but there's always hope that we'll see them another year. But I think there's hope for them if we will plant what they need in our gardens. In looking at the primary host plants for each of these species, it becomes clear why there has been a decline in numbers. Farmers are planting corn and soybeans. They are not planting cabbage and alfalfa in large masses now. Also, another host plant for the cabbage white, garlic mustard, is invasive and has been pulled consistently in many places, and it should be. And this is also true of crown vetch, another invasive that is removed frequently in a host plant for the orange sulfur. Cut leaf toothwort in the mustard family, along with cabbage and other coal crops and crest species can be a host plant for the cabbage white. Unfortunately, clover, both white and red, they are excellent host plants for the clouded and orange sulfurs, but they're often found in lawns thought to be a nuisance and eradicated with the use of weed killers. If you have clover in your lawns, move it to your garden areas and protect it. I tried to plant both last year and ran into problems with rabbit damage, but I'm gonna try again this season. I have seen big numbers of sulfurs where their host plant is available. And this is many times along sunny country roadsides where clover seems to thrive. These small caterpillars could be easily overlooked in your yard. They're very small, growing up to only about an inch and a quarter. David Wagner in his Caterpillars of Eastern North America indicates that the clouded and orange can look very similar um, and they're difficult to tell apart. So look for these, they're very small, easy to miss. Let's look at the history of our fritillaries. The fritillary of most concern is the Aphrodite. We have not seen this butterfly in our transect since 2013, and it may be extirpated. This butterfly, however, is present in great numbers in areas around mid-Michigan. I have a friend who saw 85 one day last year. So this butterfly may require a wetter habitat in summer that is no longer available at Kitty Todd. The variegated and meadow fritillary show a decline in numbers also, but I'm not too worried about these two species as they are present in good numbers. They were present in good numbers last year at another uh, location at Kitty Todd called Salamander Flats. Salamander Flats um, is off of White House Spencer Road between Old State Line and Garden Road. 
and there's a small trail and a small parking lot there and it's a fun place to look for butterflies. The Great Spangled Fritillary numbers have dropped pretty dramatically. We only saw 98 last year. The key to their success may be opening up areas where their host is present, but perhaps is being currently choked out with aggressive grasses. I want to thank Brian, Jan, and the crew at Kitty Todd who have worked to mow corridors and remove invasive plants this last year. The host plant for the fritillaries is violets. These photos are of native violets that are usually easily grown and thrive in gardens, and we see them at Kitty Todd. Planting violets in your landscape may increase fritillary numbers. Fritillaries tend to lay their eggs at the end of the season near the host. So be careful in the fall with cleanup around your violets and leave the leaves when possible. These cater caterpillars are, are certainly do look interesting and uh, also not very appetizing if you're a bird thinking about picking them up. I, I've only seen the great spangled fritillary caterpillar. I haven't seen these others, but I hope to this next season. A little bit about the morphology of caterpillars. The long hair-like outgrowths from the head or body are known as setae and the pores on the side of the body are for respiration and they're known as spiracles. They have legs, you can't see them well in this photo, but there's one coming up where you can see the legs. Uh, they, the first three legs are called thoracic legs and then they have four sets of legs towards the back called anterior prolegs and there's an anal proleg as well. This chart shows the history of four brushfoot species that are well known. This group of butterflies are called brushfoots because they use the back four legs for moving and the front two legs are reduced in size and hairy, looking like brushes. These smaller legs are thought to be used to taste and smell. Last year, we were fortunate to count 81 pearl crescents almost two times the numbers we saw in 2019. And this is a good, good example of how weather affects different butterflies differently. Um, it was a very good year for the Pearl Crescent, but not so good for many of the others. So you never know. The butterfly here most concerned is the Viceroy. We counted the fewest numbers, 36, uh, in the history of our monitoring. I always count myself lucky to see either an Eastern comma or a morning cloak on our transect. As you can see, they are not frequently counted and the morning cloak sadly is showing a decrease in numbers. So what can we plant? Um, Procrescents use asters as host plants and later also uh, for nectar. There's a lot of um, asters at Kitty Todd, and I, th I think that's one of the reasons they did so well last year. Viceroys use willows for hosts, and that plant may be a little more difficult to find, but I have been able to find it online. Uh, they will also use cottonwoods, and, which are plentiful at Kitty Todd as well as willow. Eastern commas use nettles as a host, both common and stinging, and I've seen caterpillars on both. I have had success buying nettle seeds online if anyone's interested in trying that. Um, another native host for the Eastern comma though are elms. So an elm tree might attract them to your yard. Morning cloaks use mainly willow, but also other trees and shrubs, including elm, birch, hackberry, and poplars. And these are all very interesting caterpillars. Uh, the Viceroy, I am sure that it is one that Angie found 
while we were doing our monitoring. And that, uh, that one looks a lot like a bird dropping, as does the Eastern comma caterpillar, I think. These four species, the American copper, common wood nymph, Leonard skipper, and hoary edge are all showing significant declines from earlier years. Looking at the average numbers for their 13 year history shown here, we can see the big drop in numbers. It was fortunate that Angie found one Leonard skipper last year. Leonard skipper is a special skipper to our area that many butterflies travel to see, and it is being considered for a, spe a species of concern in Ohio. You can see how the numbers have dropped. Sheep sorrel has been a host for the American copper at Kitty Todd. It is not a native plant, unfortunately, but we do keep it in the demonstration gardens, particularly for the American coppers. However, we were able to find um, other dot plants at Salamander Flats where the habitat is wetter. And we also found a few American coppers last year. The prairie grasses serve as a host for both the common wood nymph and Leonard skipper and are available in many native catalogs and also at our plant sales. Purple top grass is native to Illinois, but I've seen it here and I think it would thrive in a garden. And the hoary edge host is tick trefoil. While it's not popular due to the seeds that stick to everything in the fall, I think it's a beautiful plant. I like the blooms. And if you are lucky enough to get a hoary edge skipper, along with the sticking seeds, I think you'll be glad you planted it. Let's look at the caterpillars. These are small caterpillars. The American copper is only at full growth, a little more than half an inch. The hoary edge will grow up to a little more than an inch and a quarter. And the common nymph, wood nymph, that's an early instar for the common wood nymph. It will grow up to almost two inches. Uh, the last instar is green to yellow green. And this is a Leonard Skipper caterpillar. It was difficult to find any information on the, on the Leonard Skipper caterpillar. I was only able to find this picture in Jarrett Daniels Butterflies of Ohio book. But in this photo, you can see the legs the three thoracic prolegs, the anterior, the four anterior prolegs, and an anal proleg. We are lucky to see two special vulnerable species on our transect, the frosted elephant and the dusted skipper. The frosted elephant is an Ohio endangered species. That butterfly is about the size of your thumbnail. It has a small population. It has a single brood that flies April and May. It is a host plant specialist on lupin. And it's a Northern distributed species now only in Lucas County, as far as Ohio. And it has a fragmented and very narrow range of habitat is currently being considered for federal endangered species status. There has been a study of the frosted elephants at Kitty Todd the last three years, two 2018 and 2019, under the direction of Gard Otis from the University of Guelph in Canada. In 2019, frosted elephants were counted on May 5. A total of 39 were counted. It was predicted from that count that the population at Kitty Tab was about 240 or less. This last year, 2020, Gardotis was not able to help in account due to COVID. 
However, a group of us counted 16 frosted elfin in May. It was not a particularly good year for the frosted elfin. Why? Well, the summer of 2019 was warmer than usual with less rain. And the spring weather of 20, 2020 experienced up and down temperatures. March was a whole degree or and a half more warmer than usual. And April was a whole degree and a half uh, lower than usual, and May was just a little above normal. So April is a crucial month for the frosted elfin, and the cold weather along with rain was not uh, good for it. The Dusted Skipper, again, has a small population, single brood, they fly May through June. The host plant is little and big blue stem. There are northern distributed species in Lucas County alone now, and they have a narrow range of habitat. The dusted skipper with only three in our transect in 2019 is being closely monitored. In 2020, we were fortunate to count 15. The dusted skipper in past years was also present in Southeast Ohio, but no longer. The frosted elephant caterpillar is very small. Um, at full growth, it's about three quarters of an inch. And we've been looking for them and we, we have yet to find one, but we're hoping that maybe we'll see one this season. The dusted skipper caterpillar grows to about an inch and you can see it would certainly blend in very nicely with the grasses that are its host plant. Douglas Ptolemy has shared a lot of wisdom with us through his books. One of his ideas is to create caterpillar pupation sites under your trees. He says that 90% of caterpillars that develop on plants pupate on the ground or within underground chambers that they create. He suggests we plant under your trees, um, add an old tree stump or fallen log and large decorative rocks. And of course, treasure your leaf litter. As many small caterpillars live in curled up leaves and dozens eat fallen leaves. This is one of his latest books, Nature's Best Hope. It's a great book. Um, and he advocates in this book, creating wildlife corridors by a connection of native gardens that become a homegrown national park. It's a worthy goal that each of us can help to achieve by planting natives in our yards. I think we can save our butterflies and other important insects for future generations. And this is one of the most beautiful caterpillars, I think. It's an American lady caterpillar in pussy toes, its host plant. And you see how these leaves look white. They curl up in those leaves during the day and then they come out at night to eat. So it's all about the caterpillar and the host plant. You can be a hero by choosing the right plant. We are truly nature's best hope. It is best to buy local plants when you can. And um, please go to the Wild Ones website again for local native plant sales information. There's also a list of butterfly host plants available on the Toledo Naturalist Association website as well as a member's Facebook page for wild ones. One idea I have that may be helpful in conserving our butterflies is to challenge each of us to take a photo of caterpillars when we find them, if we can, doing it, if we can do it without harming the caterpillar, and include in the photo the plant the caterpillar is on, and then send it to wild ones for posting on their website. Thank you everyone for all of your questions and for joining us this evening. Um, if you think of further questions um, after the program, please feel free to email the Wild Ones email um, and we can try to get follow-up information for you. 
Um, thank you, Jan, so much for um, putting the presentation together and taking the time to share it all with us. Um, uh, and sharing your knowledge with us. You're very welcome. I want to wish everyone success this coming year and getting your natives in and getting butterflies in your yard. <laughs>